The RTX 2060 is a peculiar graphics card. It boasts the same GPU as its bigger brother, the 2070, but with only 1920 active CUDA cores versus 2304, and while the 2070 sports 8 gigs of VRAM, which is a fair amount for a card of its caliber, the 2060 comes equipped with only 6. As such, memory bandwidth is reduced, RT and Tensor cores are stripped down, and TDP follows suit. But so does the price. This is perhaps the first affordable, I say that in very bold quotation marks, affordable RTX graphics card. And I mean, when seen in the context of a $350 MSRP, right now you can buy it for over 400 bucks in a few cases here in the States, and even more if we're talking about internationally, it's difficult for me to say affordable, but I'm saying it anyway because when seen in the context of other RTX graphics cards, this one is affordable. So then, what is my verdict on the RTX 2060? Well, my conclusion might surprise you. So my thinking behind these upcoming tests was this. The RTX 2060 needs to perform as good as a GTX 1080 for the purchase to make sense. Before the decline of Pascal stock, you could pick up one of these for around $350 to $400. So a new card from Nvidia at this price point should perform at least as good as its predecessor, right? Why would you pay more for less performance? So you could make a similar case for the launch prices of the 1070 and 1070 Ti, and those are still valid cards to compare the 2062, but uh, the conditions there are a bit less strict because those cards are a bit weaker, and we're talking about launch prices versus current prices, and I think it's fair to base things off of current prices, even though these are dwindling in stock just because, I don't know, this card was like 600 bucks brand new, right? Now it's down to $400. It's more relevant to the buyer today. And look, I don't want to give this card any more breathing room than it deserves in this review. I take that approach to all reviews because that's what you deserve as the viewer. I won't be sugarcoating anything here. Aesthetically, I think the Founders 2060 is a beautiful card, a few odd quirks. Firstly, the 8-pin supplemental power connector resides on the right face of the card, which means it'll face toward the front of your case. And since the PCB doesn't reach this far over, the plug is actually an extension, purely a cosmetic play from Nvidia's part to keep the front face clean, and depending on who you are, you may love or hate this. The GeForce RTX text has a mirror finish, but glows neon green when powered on. It can be disabled with software, but the color itself cannot be changed. The backplate is beautiful, highlighted in a silver that seems to stand out more so than reference cards of years past. It won't work with every build color scheme, I understand that, but it's definitely flashy and looks great in our case, for example. The rear I.O. plate is a matte black as well, following suit with its bigger brothers. My only complaint back here is the lack of a third display port. Uh, port. Instead, we get good old DVI. I wonder how many people who buy this card will actually use this interface. Oh, and in case you're wondering, this card doesn't have any sag at all, which is good. It means it's very sturdy and rigid. It's not gonna, you know, pull that PCI slot with it. Oh, that is cringy to look at. So the card feels great, looks great. I mean, who cares? Like, it's heavy. Apparently, it's a major pain to disassemble. Fine, whatever, I don't believe many people will bother to swap out thermal paste on a 60 series card anyway, but so far, I'd say I'm pretty impressed. But again, who cares? This is not stuff that, that is pertinent to a graphics card in terms of its viability in the market. I think it more or less comes down to performance, so that's where gaming comes in. Can it compete with a GTX 1080? For benchmarks, the same system was used throughout and consists of an i5-8600K, 16 gigs of DDR4, and an Asus Maximus 10 Hero Z370 motherboard. If you're wondering why I chose a Core i5 in this case, the rationale involved the target audience. I felt as though a majority of potential RTX 2060 customers would end up pairing this with either a Core i5, Ryzen 7, or Ryzen 5 CPU, more, li more likely Ryzen 5 than the Ryzen 7, but still. The i5 generally outperforms the Ryzen counterparts in games, so the CPU would impose less of a bottleneck in most of the titles tested. And I should note, we weren't CPU limited in any of the games you're about to see, so it's really a non-issue. I mean, you might have gotten an extra two or three frames if we had bumped up to an i7 counterpart, more or less, again, a moot point. I just want these tests to be as realistic as possible. The only variable here is, of course, the graphics card. The RTX 2060 was swapped for our GTX 1080 Superclock from EVGA. It's a reference card with a similar cooler and double fan design. It's this one right here. Both cards support a supplemental 8-pin VGA connector, and actually it's on the side, <laughs> and uh, run at around the same temperature under load. The RTX 2060 reached 74 degrees Celsius after an hour of gaming, and this card I believe reached 71. So not bad for a reference card. It's actually in the system right next to me, so that's why I don't have it in my hand. Uh, but I mean, especially when compared to an aftermarket cooler like this, granted it is the uh, stock, the reference PCB. 
not bad. Oh, and one more thing. All of our tests were conducted in the 1440p ultra wide resolution or 3440 by 1440. In terms of total pixel count, this still keeps us much closer to standard 1440p rather than 4K, but this should keep our graphics card heavily leveraged throughout our test. I generally test in 1440p, but this will push the cards just a bit more. It won't hurt anything. Ultra wide fans, we haven't forgotten about you. Now on to the games. Up first is as usual GTA 5. In the high preset without AA or advanced graphics, our GTX 1080 pushed 136 frames per second on average, with the 2060 falling only slightly behind at 131. Things were very close here, and remember, we're pushing around 5 million pixels. This is much closer than I thought it would be, and your typical viewer wouldn't be able to discern between the two. Side by side, can you pick the GTX 1080 run? I'll give you a few seconds. Uh, yeah, good luck with this one. Up next was Doom running in the Vulcan API. Again, the GTX 1080 edged out a very slight victory, but across the board, both cards held their own. Our lowest 1% of frame rates still averaged above 120 FPS and the lowest 0.1% averaged above 100, so this is more than satisfactory. Here's a side-by-side -side, uh, of each game again, and you can try your best to figure out which is which. Next is F1 2017. Here we see our RTX 2060 falling behind for the first time, specifically with respect to the lowest 0.1% of frames. We aren't sure what exactly caused this. Our frame buffer had some breathing room uh, and thermal throttling wasn't an issue at all. I was monitoring temps the entire time. Uh, although these cards tend to kind of clock themselves based on temperature, there was no severe throttling issue. That's what I meant to say. Uh, even after three passes of this, we were seeing the exact same dip at the lowest 0.1% of frames. So I'm gonna call this an optimization issue. And I mean, F1 2017 was released in 2017. So it's been a while. Next up is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Here things are pretty much neck and neck, despite our GPU uh, being the severe bottleneck in this case. The RTX 2060 did an admirable job keeping up with the Pascal Giant. Now, PUBG is a weird one, it always is. It's come a long way since launch, but still needs a fair share of optimization. This is expressed in our lowest 0.1% of frames, where things actually took a drastic turn south for our GTX 1080. I couldn't call this the norm, definitely the exception, so depending on our config, these random stutters could make or break this game for you. Witcher 3 is a very GPU-intensive title, even without mods, and if there's any difference between these cards, this game will show that. And in the Ultra preset, less hair works, it gets very difficult. The GTX 1080's extra CUDA cores and slightly higher clock speed win without a doubt this time, and at these lower frame rates, every single one counts. 65 versus 59 on average narrows to a 5 FPS split among the lowest 0.1% of frames. This isn't a terrible disparity, but it's a bit easier to tell the difference between the two when they're running side by side at a much lower average frame rate. Okay, so ultimately the RTX 2060 lost to our GTX 1080, but it's the margins by which it lost that have me so surprised. I seriously expected this card to fall significantly further behind the mark. Mark. But does that mean the 2060 is worth its hefty 60 series price tag? This is, without a doubt, the most expensive 60 series card we've ever seen. Depends on how you look at it. For just the graphics card and assuming a $350 price tag for the 2060, that's giving it a slight edge, I understand, and a $400 price tag for the 1080, the RTX 2060 comes in at around 1.7 frames per dollar, with the GTX 1080 coming in at just under 1.6 frames per dollar. However, factoring in an additional $600 for each system build, the RTX 2060 PC earns around 0.624 frames per dollar, while the GTX 1080 PC earns 0.625. So, yeah, for all intents and purposes, when seen in the context of the the entire system, the values of these cards are almost identical. And is that a bad thing? No, not really. In my opinion, it just, I mean, look, it's no 1070, right? This isn't 980 Ti performance for the value of a 70 series card. And in the same light, this isn't 980 performance and value in a 1060, especially for the price because Pascal cards were comparatively cheaper. But what is worth noting is that we're getting almost GTX 1080 performance for between 60 and 70 series prices. It's honestly not that bad, and it leads me to conclude that the RTX 2060 is a decent buy for the money. It isn't great, but seeing as though we don't have much from the red team to compete with right now, I mean, Radon 7, come on. After my own testing, I'd say it's a win for buyers in the market for a solid 1440p graphics card. You don't have to agree with me, but based on my own test and my 
somewhat extensive, you know, I guess experience with graphics cards, I would say this is a pretty fair buy. So be sure to leave a comment down below with your current graphics card and whether or not you intend to upgrade. Also, whether or not you agree with my conclusion, this is actually a decent card for the money. Like this video if you thought it was cool, click the red button if you're feeling lucky and stay tuned for more content like this. Also stay tuned for the rumors regarding the 1660, 1660 Ti. Apparently, basically RTX 2060s without RT and Tensor Cores. Notice I didn't test Battlefield 5 in this video. I also didn't test the Metro Exodus, apparently that that just rolled out like today. Uh, so I didn't test the two games that officially support DXR uh, or ray tracing. And that's because I don't think this card is ready for that yet. I'm going to give it a few more weeks before I come back to this topic. Uh, because obviously if I tested the GTX 1080 and the RTX 2060 with DXR enabled in Battlefield 5, the RTX 2060 would 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 steal it easily because this card is not built for that kind of stuff. It can't handle that because those dedicated cores aren't present in Pascal GPUs. But when I have a few more cards on hand with which to compare, maybe optimization kind of takes hold a bit more with the few games that do support DXR, I'll revisit this and see if the 2060 is at all viable for ray tracing games. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.